So welcome to lecture 32 of MIT 16485, uh, Visual Navigation for Autonomous Vehicles. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker to be Professor John Leonard. As you all know, John is, uh, is a professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department and also a member of uh, CSA. So during uh, Visual Navigation for Autonomous Vehicles, we have been seeing a lot of uh, spatial perception and optimization techniques for perception for robotics. We spent a good amount of time on, on the SLAM side, simultaneous localization and mapping. So I'm delighted to have John today because he's pretty much one of the fathers, creators of the SLAM problem. Uh, so he decided to give us like, you know, this nice problem to solve like, you know, many, many years ago. And also I'm delighted by the fact that uh, for VNAV, we had time to cover the state of the art in how to solve the slam problem using optimization techniques. But John will be able to provide a much broader and historical perspective about the slam problem. Moreover, we use during the lecture as motivators like self-driving cars and drones as motivating uh, application for uh, these techniques. And there is no better speaker than John is spending a lot of time thinking about self-driving cars as part of this research effort with Toyota Research, uh, with the Toyota Research Institute. So, um, super happy to have you like, as, uh, as guest, guest lecturer, and uh, let's welcome John. Thank you. Hi, it's a great honor to speak to you today, and um, really, I'm trying to give two or three different lectures in, in one, and so I'm sort of, any rules you might have on how many slides to use for a talk like this are sort of thrown out the window, so I apologize for that, but there's just so much I want to say, um, and um, really the, um, uh, to me, if you're working on SLAM or thinking about SLAM visual navigation, to me it's you're joining a family. You're joining a sort of family of researchers who now over three decades have really um, tried to think deeply about the problem of how robots navigate and move through the world. And uh, so I'm going to give you a sort of a glimpse of some of the history. And it's a very sort of personal history and it might be a little biased and I'm, I'm, I apologize if I leave out the contributions of other folks. Um, but uh, really, you're in good hands with Luca, teaching you the basics, uh, the fundamentals. And if anyone saw David Rosen's talk uh, last week, that talk would be like a real contrast from this talk. David's talk was a really deep dive on one recent aspect, uh, uh, the certifiably correct slam, which is really, really important and promising for future research. I'm going to cover many topics. And so, um, so just hang on for the ride, OK? So who's heard of Amara's Law? What's Amara's law? Anyone know? It's that um, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Amara was a Silicon Valley technologist. And I think this has certainly been true with things like the mobile phone and GPS. And I think it's true with, with spatial perception, with, with, um, with SLAM and navigation. Um, I believe that there still is a bright future and many decades to run in the head ahead of us in terms of research progress to develop location-aware devices and agents for the world and ways to really truly help people. And so autonomous driving is a good motivator for working in this area. And so who's seen any autonomous driving articles in the news lately? Probably seen many, right? Um, so I just picked out some. and. Uh, uh, there was a lot of hype, you may have noticed, we're kind of on the other side of the hype curve, but kind of peak hype, hype for me was uh, in February 2018. In the past five years, autonomous driving has gone from maybe possible to definitely possible to inevitable. To how did anyone ever think this wasn't inevitable? So I think it's not inevitable, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, there were articles like self-driving cars will keep getting better forever, you know, acquiring more and more data and sort of virtuous cycle. Um, and uh, there were some very high profile startups. So your self-driving car might look like this. This was Zooks getting an $800 million investment. It's a really amazing company led by SLAM uh, person, Jeffy Le Jesse Levinson. Um, and, uh, but more recently, you can find more sort of comments that are a little more on the skeptical side or that it might take this a little longer. And I just pulled one recently in terms of you know, the, what happened to self-driving cars in terms of there was the Google peak interest was around this time and then it dropped, dropped off a bit. Um, and so, uh, but a very interesting recent milestone is that one of the journalists that I follow, Ed Niedermeyer, he got a drive in a Waymo Chrysler Pacifica minivan in Arizona recently, fully autonomous, no driver. So if you might say when are self-driving cars going to arrive, they're actually here already. And it's been said that the future is already with us, it's just very unevenly distributed. And I think the key question for self-driving is not going to be 
when, but where, in terms of where over time, and in terms of different operational design domains. And a lot of this has to do with mapping. So mapping and navigation, really one of the four critical challenges in my view. So um, if we had more time, I'd ask you with uh, some polling software, but I'm just gonna do sort of more of a show of hands. Uh, when do folks think they'll be able to ride in a fully self-driving car with no driver, like Ed Niedermeyer just had in Arizona, to go from MIT uh, to Logan Airport? Anyone think like within the next five years you'll be able to do that? Like all the time or one time? Let's say, uh, usually I'd say, <laughs> first let's just say you'll be able to do it at once, yeah, once, in the next five years, okay? How about it'll take five to 10 years? How about more than 10 years? More than 10 years, okay. So um, how about in any weather conditions for which Logan Airport is operating? <laughs> so light snow, you think, would you change your answer or keep your answer the same? Okay, um, the, uh, so for me, um, I think it's gonna take a lot longer. I'm sort of a skeptic on the widespread deployment of self-driving, but I, I stand to be proven wrong because we, do, we are amazed by sort of advances. And so a brief history for myself, I feel like so fortunate to uh, have followed the sort of trajectory uh, in life that I've had. Um, so I grew up in Philadelphia, went to Penn undergrad, went to Oxford for my PhD, uh, came to MIT in 1991 to do autonomous underwater vehicles, joined the ocean engineering here in Building 5 uh, in 96, and we merged with Mechanical in 2005. I got to join the ALA, which merged with LCS to make CSAIL. Um, and I think a lot about mapping and localization. Um, in fact, you could say that I'm still working on my PhD thesis 32 years after starting it, uh, which is usually the kiss of death in an academic career. So I, um, I still have imposter syndrome. Um, but uh, the, um, and I've been off at Toyota for a bit on sabbatical and I'm still a technical advisor there. And so I've worked with underwater vehicles and on essence of SLAM and self-driving. And so if you think about, so the first sentence of my thesis was the navigation problem, the robot navigation problem can be summarized as answering three questions. Where am I? Where am I going? How should I get there? And where am I is really the confidence of localization. So humans have many sort of varying abilities of localization and there's a whole question of how does the brain work? How do animals navigate? We have some collaborations with neuroscientists at Boston University thinking about things like grid cells and play cells and is there metrical information in the brain? There are a lot of wonderful science questions, but just looking at a building like this, can you tell where you are? Does anyone recognize that building? I'd be surprised, but maybe some of you. Can you guess what country or what continent? It's in the UK. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, the Jenkins building in Oxford. That's where I was a PhD student. And in the basement of that building, um, has anyone ever heard of the uh, multi-view geometry book by Andrew Zisterman? So SLAM is sort of related or exactly the same as sort of, uh, or a subset of the structure from motion problem in computer vision. And so this book has a, f a somewhat famous example of, uh, you know, about 15 images taken by a robot with structure from motion used can concurrently estimate the 3D structure of the world and the mo motion of the robot. And so that, that's in the basement of this building, this picture, these pictures were taken and that's where I slaved away uh, as a graduate student, um, where we had some of the first Sun workstations in the UK, and and uh, and so I learned to, to pr program in C, and uh, I wanted to use computer vision. In fact, anyone know what the box next to me is? I'd be surprised if you did, but it's a it's something called a data cube. It cost about a hundred thousand dollars to a hundred thousand pounds, depending on where you bought it, and it um, it could do frame grabbing and edge detection at three frames per second. It was really really difficult to program, and um, Early attempts to do computer vision taught me that it wasn't ready yet, and so I switched to using sonar. Uh, and so the, um, I had several robots, but one of the robots had had eight of the little Polaroid sonars around the side of it. Uh, and what I did is I made a sort of a program, a visualization program where you could, I needed to see what is the robot seeing? Show me the data, you know, like how do you, and so we used early primitive sort of graphics on the sun, and I had, um, the, one of the key things is that the dead reckoning error grows without bounds. So this is, say, the robot starting in a known position. The triangle is the dead reckoned position. This robot had these sort of, sort of a wheelchair uh, design with sliding, fr with rotating front wheels. And the dead reckoning would quickly diverge. And what we're able to do is with a, um, a hand-measured map of the environment in terms of plane, cylinder, and, and uh, point-like features, we could predict some of the sonar measurements and match those against the model. And then with a common filter, we could set up a sort of a, a motion estimation. And one way of thinking about localization is if you start where you, you, if you know your starting position, 
It's a process of not getting lost, of sort of constraining the drift of dead reckoning. In other situations, like the kidnap robot problem, you put a robot in an unknown environment with, without an a priori position estimate, that's a lot harder. But the goal was to try to achieve a sort of competence of localization by sensing the geometry of the world, comparing observations with a map. So it was the process of prediction and explanation. And if you, uh, and data association, which measurements correspond to which features, uh, which measurements can be ignored, and then inference, once you have measurements, how do you combine those with knowledge of sensor models and motion models? And what I really wanted to do was to deal with a changing environment. And so the whole issue of dynamic mapping when the world changes, to me, I think it's actually still a hard problem, um, depending on your problem objectives. And if you flash forward to today, so this is a video, a still from a, a video released by Google in 1994 of their self-driving car in, um, in Mountain View, California. And the way the Google car navigates is it has a very accurate map that is made in advance by driving a robot around manually many, many times. And then they do an offline slam process to sort of try to correct all the trajectories and come up with a, a representation of the world with uh, intensity information. So, so it's not that they're explicitly mapping the lane lines or the curves, but they're just mapping the LIDAR reflectance from a Velodyne laser scanner off the road surface, and then they can localize the robot down to several centimeters level of precision. And so it's been said that um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Have you heard that? I think it was Arthur C. Clarke. And what I would say to that is magicians don't often reveal their secrets. Um, but the map is one of the secrets of the magic trick of self-driving. So obviously it's here and you journalists have driven in fully autonomous Waymos in Arizona. And so clearly there's potential and clearly it works. But if the world changes substantially, now I got to drive in this system uh, 94 July after RSS at Berkeley and Google were very generous gave me this awesome ride around downtown Mountain View and I posted on Facebook I felt like I was on the beach at Kitty Hawk you know that it just really was awesome one of the things that it did then it's also shown in this video is deviating around some cones so it's hard to see but there are some construction cones here and um, this is going to really stand in history as just an amazing technological achievement. Um, and if you look at how the Google self-driving car works, there's a wonderful presentation from 2013 from Dave Ferguson, who's off at a startup now called Neuro, uh, where he talks about how they build the platform, add sensors, uh, find the car, so mapping and localization, and perceive the world, uh, and then move the car. And, and what the map gives you and your knowledge of position is the ability to predict expected data so that then you then can explain the unexpected data. And if you turn a robot loose in the wild in downtown Boston with no prior map, it's very hard to have this sort of context to sort of know what, what to do with all this data. But if you can locate, location gives you context, which simplifies perception, adds robustness. Um, and so this has a very long history in robotics. So I've, I'm sort of a history junkie. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I guess uh, if you go back one slide. Sure, sure, sure. This one or the one? Uh, this one? This one, yeah. So I always think, can we separate sort of the SLAM problem from what the actual sort of full application is? So for example, the representation I might need if I'm a self-driving car is maybe quite different from what I need if I'm a drone, like a Skydio drone. So, Agree, yeah. Um, should we, is SLAM a thing that should live, that can live on its own? Like is just knowing where I am in a pre-made map enough? Or like is that a global sort of uh, useful technology, or do we need to think more coupled about what problem we're actually solving and build a map that's specific? I would say both, in the sense that I would say there are certain applications where you can make the map in advance, just make sure the world doesn't change, and you've got this competence of localization, you don't have to worry about it. In fact, um, but I would also say that for sort of true long-term autonomy, where you can make robots that are persistently operating in dynamic changing environments, the ability to sort of update the representations and then think also, couple it back to path planning and, and sort of uh, task understanding, I think that, I see that as still um, fertile ground for research, because I think you're gonna need that to build long-live autonomous agents. Um, so, but great question. So, I've, uh, so I'm a history junkie and I have a lot of vi videos of old robots. Actually, some of these might be too loud. Uh, the, uh, um, but has anyone heard of Shaky? So Shaky was in the 60s and uh, very autonomous, uh, sorry, very advanced for its era. They used sort of wireless communications to a mainframe and they solve these sort of symbolic reasoning tasks. Um, 
this was at SRI in California, and I won't play the whole thing, but it's amazing how the robot sort of came, it's a good song. Anyway, um, and then um, another early pioneering project was from uh, Hilaire, uh, from Raja Shatila and Joe Giralt's group at Toulouse, France. And uh, there was actually a um, half hour 1981 television show on French TV, which is lots of the robot just driving around this world with plywood walls. Uh, and then it cuts to uh, Raja Shatila describing the motion planning problem on the blackboard, you know? And um, it's, um, if anyone's going to Ikra this year, or hopefully hoping to go to Ikra this year. So Raja, it's in, it's in Paris and Raja's there now. And, um, but there were these different historical traditions in terms of what representations folks chose to attack spatial um, intelligence. Uh, and so Raja was, probably, arguably, the first to advocate for geometric representations. Any French speakers here? So... <laughs> I can share these videos if you want. It's, in, it's really interesting sort of history. Uh, and in the U.S., a really important project was the work of um, um, Fran Hans Marvik at, at Stanford uh, with the Stanford CART. Uh, and I'll show that in a second. I think of a bigger version. Another early um, approach was uh, Ben Kuypers, who's at Michigan, uh, who thought about how humans navigate. And he did a PhD in the AI lab at MIT where he talked about the topological map of, of Cambridge, you know, and the red line and different things. And so um, the, uh, but really, um, Hans Marvik deserves incredible credit. Back in the 1970s, Marvik started what he thought would be a very simple task. He hit a problem kill things that, although they at first looked like they might be easier because human beings do them more easily, that in fact turned out to be heartbreakingly difficult. And those were things like looking at the world and seeing what, what objects there were in front of the camera that was connected to the computer and moving around competently in the world, you know, the, the typical robot tasks. So these Each flash here represents 15 minutes of computing time. So in the robot they had of the day, they had a single camera. The cameras were so expensive, they put a single camera on a linear slider. They'd stop, and then the camera would slide between nine different positions. He did this amazing multi-view uh, pyramid stereo scheme to try to get faster processing. It still took 15 minutes of processing every time the robot moved. He built his own wireless link that didn't, couldn't buy one. It exists just as part of his PhD project. Um, but the tragic thing is he did this big, like, um, this is the experiment I need to graduate. Um, in Stanford, he did it outside and the sun was out. And so in the 15 minutes between the robot was thinking before it moved, the shadows would move. Uh, and it completely confused the robot in terms of the representation of the world. And it turned out, um, anyone know who Hans Marvik's uh, office mate at Stanford was as a graduate student? So Rodney Brooks, have you heard of Rodney Brooks? So Rod was Hans' office mate and saw him trying to do this with the sun moving and said, this is crazy, there's gotta be a better way. Um, and in fact, I think a big, so one of the things that's amazing about um, the robot navigation problem, that, that there are these really fundamental different questions, I think, that define an axis of different um, spaces where you can work. And the question of representation is really vital. Like, how do you represent the world? Um, how do you perform inference? And then how do you build systems and make them autonomous? And over the years, the, the the techniques used in these different domains have sort of evolved I and mean, combined, combined and, and have created things like Skydio where you can have a commercially deployable system that's doing visual slam on a consumer product. Um, for inference, we, we sort of try to cast it as a state estimation uh, problem, but we have to solve the data association problem. And increasingly, folks are trying to use more and more learning. Um, for representation, there's an age-old debate between metric versus topological representations. Do we build dense models, maybe ena enabled by GPUs? Um, do we represent the world in terms of objects? Note that Marvik talked about objects, you know, in terms of what I'd call semantic slam. Um, and how do we get more of a spatial understanding of the world in terms of symbolic concepts that might, uh, a human might use? Uh, and uh, in the biological literature, they think a lot about these problems between what are called allocentric and elocentric representations. Do you, is everything relative to the robot or relative to 
to the world. Um, and there's a big gulf between having a demo in the lab, maybe a figure in your paper or video, to having something that you can actually deploy. Did Scadio talk a lot about that? Uh, oh, that's Wednesday, gosh, yeah. Ask them how they deal with degenerate motion trajectories. Like if the user flies the vehicle straight, how do they deal with sort of singularities and, and not, you know, adverse motions? There's a lot of really hard problems to deploy to a commercial product. But if you think about just about representation, uh, there were a few c early critical representations. And I feel, um, I don't want to sound like a real uh, grandfather kind of type, but uh, you guys have it so lucky today with Google Scholar, uh, the ability to quickly get papers archive. Um, in, the, in the good old days, um, you'd have to walk 10 minutes down the street to go into the library if it was open and bring your little five pence coins to f look through the shelves and find the ICRA proceedings. Uh, find the right volume and then go photocopy the pages one by one at the at the coin operated photo machine and for me starting in 1987 uh, the sort of recent 1986 and 85 ICRA, uh, which were the second and third ICRA conferences, really defined my whole way of thinking about the, the, the problem. And so in 1985 ICRA, if you could go back in a time machine as a slam person, I heard there was a really interesting argument and fight debate. Um, but Hans Marvik and Alberto Elf as a student came up with the occupancy grid model where you sort of represent the world with discrete cells. Something like an Octomap is a modern version of this. Um, I was never a fan of occupancy grids because they kind of take the error in the data and they smear it out all over the place hoping it will go away whereas with sonar we can model the physics and explicitly take the range measurement and throw away the the angle um, and another really pivotal paper from this conference was Rodney Brooks and he uh, advocated for using vision way ahead of his time and using what he called a rubbery stretch stretchy map representation and in fact the abstract of this paper sorry for the print but mobile robots sense their environment and receive error laden readings they try to move a certain distance and direction and do so only approximately. Rather than try to engineer these problems away, it might be possible and maybe necessary to develop map making and navigation algorithms which explicitly represent these uncertainties but still provide robust performance. To me that's the sort of birth of probabilistic robotics. It was also happening in France trying to think about how do we measure um, and deal with uncertainty. Um, but in the same conference, so Raja, and I showed the video uh, clip before, they advocated for position referencing and consistent world models, so aiming for consistency so that you could actually represent the world in terms of geometric primitives and try to combine the data in a consistent way. And to me, this was sort of the, the I felt this approach would yield the best progress uh, in the next few years. Um, and around the same time, uh, Smith, Self, and Cheeseman came out with a very influential paper uh, published in a few different places. There were two papers, uh, but one called a stochastic map for spatial relationships, where they, um, rather than treating spatial uncertainty as a side issue, we believe it must be intrinsic to the spatial representations. And so this thing they call the stochastic map and ways to um, build it and combine it, revise it incrementally. And what they came up with was representing position uh, errors for, ro for robot poses and objects in the world with Gaussians and representing sort of the uncertainty for visualization with an error ellipse and then combining the measurement with linearization measurements with linearization over multiple uh, positions so this is essentially common filtering and so they really their their paper only had a little hand sketched example and they didn't actually have an op actual implementation to my knowledge so my advisor Hugh Durant White did his PhD at UPenn and he was he uh, did something kind of similar thinking about how we fuse multiple types of sensor data from different uh, observation points and um, so where I came in was trying to think, well, what if we had the, pr the goal was to build the map and localize at the same time. And in my thesis, I called it simultaneous map building and localization, which is SMAL or small. And so, uh, which is a bad name for the biggest problem in the 1990s in mobile robots. And so, um, but I, I never really got to doing both at the same time, but given a map, you could localize by say the map lets you predict your measurements, you take your observations, you match them, you do estimation, you create a feedback loop, and you control the robot. So what I was able to do, um, I created um, a fully autonomous system where I could press start and t touch nothing, and the robot would navigate around this pillar um, very slowly. Uh, and this video is an actual screen recording of taking a camera recording a screen, because there, was no, there were no screen <laughs> capture software available at the time. And so you can actually see the 
tripod shake when you start and end the video. And so, um, and we did it for that robot in Oxford. We did it in a project in France. Uh, and the other thing we tried to do was if you had accurate position estimates, how would you build a map? And so, the, so there's a whole 20 minute side story, which I don't have time for, about sonar, of like the Polaroid sonar where it gave really inaccurate measurements. Um, but what I did is actually broke into Hugh's office, moved the furniture, and I made a very simple world with some cardboard boxes in the middle of the night and moved, a, we had a robot, but it was kind of broken. And so I just moved it amongst a coordinate grid of different positions and took different scans, extracted features from the scans, matched the scans together, and showed that you could match the data from multiple positions, fuse them with a common filter, put them in a map of line, segment, and, co and point corner fe features. Um, but we tried to sort of put it all together, but I kind of ran out of time, wanted to come back to the US. The first complete SLAM implementation doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. So in Raja uh, Shatila's lab in Toulouse, Philippe Moutelier's thesis, um, he uh, was able to use laser scanners with line segment primitives. And the key thing that he did was getting the covariance matrix correct so that you represented the correlations between the arrows in the robot and landmark poses. And back in the late 80s, this worried us a lot because it scaled quadratically. Uh, uh, and we were just fighting the lack of computation to be able to do anything like vision on board the robot. Um, and uh, I also thought about the dynamic mapping problem and I sort of used some of the data I had where I changed the world and tried to detect that auto automatically. And that's part of this larger architecture where you'd have this sort of prediction and matching, compute your position update, but also if something doesn't, so if something doesn't match your prediction of what you expect to see, that's something you have to explain. So there's sort of these two different time cycles, predicting the expected and using it for control, and then explaining the unexpected by sort of adding new features to the map. And maybe if something's disappeared, you would sort of try to remove it uh, from your map. Um, the first use of the term SLAM came in a paper. Uh, it was ultimately published in 1995 in ISRR. I think that conference happened a few years earlier. Uh, of uh, Hugh realized that switching the order of the L and the M, making the acronym SLAM is a much more powerful sort of acronym. Um, and, uh, and so um, Hugh moved to Australia and had a really strong research group uh, in Sydney. Uh, lots of important fundamental work. Paul Newman did his PhD uh, with Hugh before he came to be my first postdoc at MIT, which was like the luckiest thing ever to happen to me. Uh, and. Um, uh, so in SLAM, we've worked on many, many different implementations over the years, uh, but the basic idea, um, I'm sure you know it well, of this is with LiDAR, that's with an early computer vision sensor, Mike Bossa put a camera on a bike with some mirrors, uh, uh, PR2 with stereo data, or uh, Connect doing dense loop closure, that's with Tom Whelan, and um, the uh, the, the really neat thing about the SLAM problem is we really attracted a crowd. And in fact, uh, Sebastian Thrun started working in, on SLAM in sort of circa 1999 with some of the early AI robot competitions himself, Dieter Fox, Wolfram Burgard. And uh, just the, the SICK laser scanner became available. So sonar was really noisy and challenging and paradoxical, whereas the LiDAR gave you the kind of information that you might want. And so um, back with the sonar, some of the experiments, this was in France of this is the dead reckoning, this is being able to no localize against the map. You know, we were uh, kind of, I only dreamed of having something like a sick LiDAR at that time. I came to MIT to work on underwater vehicles, and underwater you don't have GPS. You can, acoust you can use acoustic beacons to position yourself, but that's, they're expensive to deploy. Uh, and some applications you might need to if there's a truly featureless world, but if you're, say, mapping a shipwreck, maybe you can use the features of what you're mapping to navigate yourself. Um, so underwater is a whole other story, and it's really a rich problem space, and I really enjoyed working on underwater problems. Um, um, Let's see, so in terms of like a time, a quick timeline of things, the SICK laser scanner came out and also people started to build more capable uh, mobile robots. So this uh, red, we call it the trash can on wheels, B21 robot, had a ring of Polaroid sonars, some SICK under here, and we occasionally put cameras on it. This is Michael Bossa, who I think is at Zooks now, the startup I showed their picture of. Paul has a startup called Oxpotica. He is, runs a, the Robotics Institute at Oxford. Uh, we did a demonstration at the 2002 AI, AAAI robot exhibition where we had a full LiDAR SLAM implementation running coupled to exploration, wandering around with people, and so forth. And, um, 
the, uh, let's see, so let me give you a, a brief sort of historical perspective. I really should come back and talk about self-driving cars or tell you where you can look online. Um, but from the, I think it's important to look at some of the history of representations because it might inform current efforts to sort of go back and think. And so uh, Lou and Melios in Canada, um, they took sick data. This is just going back and forth uh, in a corridor. And you can see as the robot rotates, you get these big angular errors. And they said, well, what we want to do is take this and get it into this. And so they came up with pose graph optimization. So instead of just representing the current robot position and say some geometric features in the world, they changed it so that the entire trajectory of the robot is remembered along with the sonar sensor data. And the goal is to try to find the constraints between the different poses, either sequential or non-sequential poses for loop closures, to try to optimize the map. And um, the, uh, another thing that happened around that time in sort of the late 90s was Andrew Davison at Oxford did the first real-time visual slam implementation. I do have a video of this, but it didn't show up in this uh, presentation. But he had an active stereo head where he could steer it at particular features. And vision was too slow at the time to even consider trying to process an entire image. But by looking for particular features, he could slowly navigate a robot across um, the, the room in one of the labs at Oxford. And, uh, the next big thing that came along was closing large loops. So Kirk Connellidge is a pioneer in SLAM, and he, uh, with, uh, Melio, with Stefan Goodman, they um, developed a technique with, they built in the Lou and Melios uh, sort of uh, approach, but they could deal with really um, closing large loops where you could correct the error. Um, uh, here at MIT, I was very fortunate to have some visitors from Spain, uh, Castellanos and, and Tardos, who are um, so, who, who in more of the common filtering, more of the Toulouse, France kind of tradition, or the geometric modeling based with careful representation of the errors, um, they really tried to think about the issue of consistency and data association from a more fundamental uh, perspective. Um, Let's see, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, how much, so one of the most important robot demos in, in the history of mobile robots was this deployment at the Smithsonian Museum. Minerva is a tour guide robot. That Whose voice? The Smithsonian National Museum of American History for two weeks in the summer of 1998. The next exhibit is the blue washing machine at the very back over there. Minerva ran completely autonomously. Any guesses who's talking? Thousands of people. I think he might have been a first year graduate student. Robots that works in real world situations in a realistic manner. She operates in extremely crowded and dynamic. You can't recognize that voice. Under extremely adverse yeah. conditions. She can interact with people in real time using a combination of her voice and her facial expressions. It's uh, Professor Nick Roy. <laughs> Could you please stay behind me? speeds up to 1.6 meters per second. Minerva runs both during the day and at night when the museum is empty. In this way, she not only provides a new experience for local visitors to the museum, but she also gives tours to people around the world. So they used a LiDAR and they did some 2D-based mapping. University of Pittsburgh and the University of Bonn in Germany. They had a key trick. The they looked at the ceiling. So they used an upward looking camera to see the intensity of the lights, which were consistent. It's pretty much the same way that the Google car navigates by looking at the intensity of the ladder reflections off the ground. And so this is a little bit in the category of the magicians not revealing their secrets. But it seemed. It seemed a lot more autonomous than, than it really was, but it was an awesome, awesome achievement. And so. Um, so around this time, people started to try to think about data sets and evaluation. And um, the, uh, there's a famous Victoria Park data set, if you've not heard of it, you're, uh, where they took a pickup truck in Sydney with a sick lighter and they just drove around a bunch of trees. This uh, really led to a lot of papers because people could sort of compare results and, and evaluation is really important. Um, here at MIT, um, way back when Paul Newman was a postdoc, uh, they, they um, 
Lobby 7, where the coffee is, the ceiling was blacked out in World War II to not let the lights out. And MIT, like 40 or 50 years later, got around to, to taking away the papers and restoring the ceiling. So they put some scaffolding up in Lobby 7, and uh, we were able to navigate the robot around manually to the far side of the lobby, and then tell the robot to come home, uh, and it would autonomously um, find its way using its prior map with a sort of trail of breadcrumbs left behind to solve a little path planning problem. So, so this is when you started to see the first SLAM implementations that could, have, could, have, could have operate with people uh, and, uh, and work robustly. We had something called the first SLAM summer school in 2002 and uh, the uh, so there's Henrik Christensen, Sebastian Thrun, uh, Wolfram Burgard, uh, who's now uh, on, on sabbatical Toyota, Mike Montemerlo, who, who was the original father of the Google self-driving car mapping parts, and lots of other people, and Eduardo Nibat, Mingo Tardos. There's, if SLAM were a stock, it would be like buying a stock in Apple, you know, uh, 20 years ago. But uh, one thing I want to tell you is that people like Hugh said, SLAM is solved. SLAM is solved. Stop working on SLAM, John, you know, and uh, I just was persisted, driven by this sort of goal of robustness. And so people like, this is Hugh and Sebastian, you know, like arguing over representations in this sort of this timeless kind of way. Um, and, um, but uh, the other uh, dominant thing that came along, so the Minerva robot navigated with part, yep? So I feel like SLAM has been a success story in the last, like, two decades. So what do you think of which problems have been solved and what are the open problems? Sure, I'll try to get to that. Yeah, yeah. actually, I should probably stop the boring history. But uh, <laughs> so the other dominant thing was particle filters. So using particle filters to represent uncertainty, lots of loop closing, trying it underwater, uh, using vision underwater, mapping the Titanic. Uh, uh, right, they wrote a textbook. Uh, the um, and then we got to taking pose graphs and connecting to linear algebra, smoothing and mapping, ISAM, uh, G2O, uh, real-time visual SLAM implementation, parallel tracking and mapping, um, really using vision for loop closing, uh, doing massive loop closing like Mike Milford, Rat SLAM, Paul Newman, FabMap, uh, um, dense 3D models, Connect Fusion. Uh, so uh, the um, and being able to close large loops and building systems where you can sort of use a GPU to sort of kind of almost like hoover up the geometry of the world and connect that back. So a lot of this stuff is being now commercialized, this sort of thing with Facebook, Oculus Rift, things like that. Um, doing things underwater, object-based SLAM, where you try to represent in terms of objects, Google Tango. This is Luca's history of things evolving and, and you know, we can add in more coordinate frames. Let me jump to the uh, connecting to walking. Uh, let, me, um, let me tell you that, okay, let me use this. So, so, um, uh, so I think that we've obviously had a revolution in machine learning in the last sort of five to 10 years with things like ImageNet. And you might say that if a computer can recognize object with very high probability, um, does that sort of make SLAM unnecessary? Like just train a deep network and it'll all sort of work. Um, and that might work for some applications, um, but I believe, I believe we have to strive towards really robust, trustworthy mobile systems. And so knowing your location is really pivotal for sort of like the safety case of how you build a self-driving car or you deploy a robot in someone's house to say so help the elderly. And so um, if you know about ROC curves in terms of probability of detection, probability of false alarm, I want to be on the place of the ROC curve where the detection probability is one minus epsilon and the false alarm probability is, is epsilon. Where, where, um, and I believe to get those truly robust systems in the next sort of decade or two, we're going to need systems that use their location information and some prior knowledge of context to let them be certifiably sort of trustworthy within a given operating regime. So how do you make, um, so how do you create a robot that you could, like imagine a robot, I've always wanted to do this, is to sort of uh, imagine giving, uh, I bring along a robot, I open the door, and I say goodbye, 
the robot wanders off with no prior map. It goes around, maybe closes some loops, comes back, maybe makes some friends, it comes back. Uh, and I have absolute certainty that that robot, when I open the door again, 45 minutes later after starting the lecture, the robot's going to be right back. And it's going to be, whatever it encountered in its journey, it was sort of able to recover from any mistakes and sort of pick itself. So sort of like a resilient, robust, trustworthy system. And I, further, I think that creating such a system is not just sort of good system engineering. I think it, that there are fundamental questions about how you represent the uh, environment, how you attack the problem algorithmically, and I would give David Rosen and Luca's work as one example in terms of the, so. Um, but I also think we need to strive towards more symbolic representations, like uh, where we can have a robot that has a notion of what are the static objects versus the dynamic objects in the world, uh, a robot that can, um, in effect, learn new concepts about objects and how they behave and where they're found, and a sense of place that sort of just emerges from the data. How's that sound? Yep. I feel like there's very few examples in nature where what you just described could ever, you could ever say you could do that. But even a very well trained human, put them here and then let them go around, it's very likely that they'll get lost. They might ask for help. To sure. They might use their mobile phone. Yeah, you know, and then you think about like a baby or something like that. Like you don't, totally couldn't do it with that. Well, but I would say. So um, much, so much like iterative learning and like building of knowledge across multiple. Well, I think, I think biological systems have an ongoing autonomous existence. You know, I, I've thought about like having, what would it mean to have robot dreaming, where your robot sort of explores some part of the world, goes home, recharges its battery, and then sort of somehow does a sort of the memory reorganization overnight, you know. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, humans don't need 10 million examples of a chair to know what a chair is. And how, uh, how do you, can you create a system that has this sort of this long-term autonomous existence that it can use to sort of develop knowledge of concepts and, and how the world works? And I just think that in the process of doing so, location information is vital to sort of enable the sort of the indexing of recalling information. So for example, in the I, would, I would argue that, you know, Google using the map as the API is part of that in the sense that if you have multiple robot systems building that map, then they're, maybe not this individual robot isn't necessarily the one that has the autonomous existence, but the system has the autonomous existence. Sure, sure. Um, I think that's, uh, that's certainly a good point. I think that, yeah, is it the agent or the system sort of collectively? That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, one thing from the neuroscience literature is that if you, um, so there are these things called play cells and grid cells that are in the lateral and interanal cortex, lateral, lateral and medial interanal cortex, and they provide a certain spatial positioning mechanism and sort of metrically um, w metric way to, to to say to say rats and navigating a, in a small field, uh, and what they've what they found is that if those mechanisms are um, disabled, it, it it impacts the ability to form long term memories. Or, or there's a coupling between those parts of the brain and the hippocampus. And this is something where I collaborate with folks like Mike Hasselmo at BU um, to sort of, sort of hang on by my fingernails to try to get the general gist of the story. But that um, there was a famous patient, HM, whose hippocampus was um, lesioned, and he lost the ability to form new memories. And it's been hypothesized that this, that laying down memories is enabled by some sort of spatial awareness scaffolding that might be quite metrical in terms of knowing the positions of things. So if we, our robot, if it can keep track in some representation of where it is in the world when it encounters new objects, maybe that provides the sort of self-supervision capability to help it aggregate data from multiple views or robustly combine data. But this is all like things that I think with this is many directions to potentially go and a lot of potential work to try to do. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Can you talk a little bit more about your collaboration with neuroscience and has that actually influenced anything on the algorithmic side? Sure. Um, so my, um, I had a PhD student, Harley Johansson, who, who's back in Iceland building autonomous underwater vehicles, but he was supported by something we call the grid cell MURI, uh, where he wanted to create a temporarily scalable SLAM system so that with the PR2, it's one of the videos I showed, 
he created a mechanism whereby there were these grid-like regions in the world where once you had enough samples of experience from those places, those poses, instead of adding new poses, which is not temporally scalable, you would find a way to reuse the old poses by kind of stitching yourself back into your old map. And so uh, we, we used a sort of grid-like we sort of combine a grid cell mechanism, sorry, a grid-like spatial data structure to try to keep track of the robot poses. And that was like as close as we could get to the grid cell inspiration, but really very different. So actually, I, in my new project I'm starting on the neuroautonomy BU, uh, Muri with BU, I would really love to try to create a, um, uh, something with, say, GTSAM that uses factor graphs and sort of the modern machinery of probabilistic graphical models to try to more explicitly represent how the grid cells uh, work. So it's a really fascinating topic, and, and it's, uh, it's ripe for sort of new ideas. So, um, okay, well, in terms of the slam history part, I think you just need to just watch people like Luca and see the sort of history unfolding. <clears throat> and you might say that all the good work's happening in industry. Go work for Skydio or for Facebook. But I believe there's always room for a young professor with seven grad students and a postdoc to sort of write on the blackboard or the whiteboard and try to really think about the problem formulation in a fundamental way without the sort of deadlines of shipping a product in three to six months. And so I have faith that there are going to be new techniques that are going to come that are going to improve the robustness and spatial scalability uh, of, of these techniques. Okay, so if um, the, um, so in my final two minutes, I could tell you a whole self-driving car story. Um, there's, there, if you send me a link, I'll show you the video uh, link online when I talk for the MIT K California Club. But let me just try in two minutes. Do you have a classroom coming in right afterwards? I'll end on time. But uh, the DARPA challenge, which we did in 2006, 2007, it was sort of this Woodstock of robotics experience. Uh, for me, I was with some amazing faculty colleagues. So uh, Seth Teller, uh, um, Jonathan Howe, Luke, uh, um, Emilio Fazzoli. So we, um, we built a car that tried to navigate more with perception than blind, blindly following GPS breadcrumbs on a prior map. And uh, we... Um, it was just this intense mission focus driven 18 month exercise. We wrote 140,000 lines of C code, created LCM, um, did some of the first close up RRT uh, path planning. And uh, one of the things I like to tell in the DARPA challenge thing is the kind of where are they now? And, and maybe this is just endemic to a place like MIT. And I really feel like you've all won the lottery in life in terms of being at a place like MIT and to work with such amazing colleagues. And even if you have a rough day now and then to, to, to think, you know, um, there was Sirtash as a master's student. He wrote our controller. Uh, <laughs> you know, Yoshi Kawada was John's postdoc. He's the, uh, one of the engineers that landed the rockets back on the barge uh, uh, and on land for, for SpaceX. Uh, Ed Olson, you know, has a startup May Mobility. Um, Luke's a TRI. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of great things happening. And it was a very student-run sort of initiative. Uh, and just, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it was... Um, it was just amazing that we were able to build a fully functioning robot with lots of the innovative things thrown in there. And it's really part of the sort of MIT experience. But let me just jump to the, to the long story is $2 million for first place, $1 million for second place, half a million dollars for third place, nothing for fourth place. <laughs> um, we were very distant fourth place, and you could argue Penn should have been fourth place. But we did have, uh, I'll show you this and then I'll stop. Uh, we had a little incident with Cornell, which... Um, Check in once again with the boss. That's Carnegie Mellon who won the race. And the key thing is we weren't using vision to try to recognize objects. Vision wasn't mature enough. And making a decision about slowly moving obstacles is really hard. So we were trying to pass Cornell for about three or four minutes. They were having a problem with their controller actuator stopping and starting. And it looks like they're the 79 is trying to pass and has passed the chase vehicle for Skynet. The 26 vehicle. Wow. And Talos is going to and Talos is going to pass. Very aggressive. Oh boy. That is, you know, that's a bold maneuver. <laughs>
So with a self-driving car, you can sort of look in the representation and replay it. I'll stop in 30 seconds. So to our laser scanner, this was just a blob of, lid blob of LiDAR points. And we actually had three or four bugs, four or five bugs. Cornell had three or four bugs. And they interacted to give this really bad behavior. Um, even when we tried to do an emergency stop, our, our steering wheel steered straight during the emergency stop. And uh, at that time, we traded our data logs with Cornell. And we wrote uh, a journal article. It was a 38-page peer review accident report on the, <laughs> the MIT Cornell collision and why it happened, as well as some other. Uh, and um, it turns out there was a bug in our code. Well, not so much a bug. It was a design decision. Anything that was moving less than uh, three meters per second was not considered a car. Because, uh, and then we didn't give an exclusion region in front of it. And you might say, why would you do that? But if, if every static object could potentially be a car, if it has any velocity, then as you move around the world and things look like they're moving, your robot becomes too scared to actually move. Um, and so, but I have fond memories of lots of late night hacking and, and you know, building a system. Uh, and if, uh, and if you, um, but if you really think about like the, the real product is the people and people like you and sort of what they go on to achieve. And so 12 years later, it's a pretty amazing group. Um, and so, um, so the short version is that Carnegie Mellon and Stanford use accurate prior maps where they gave the car very precise GPS waypoints to follow. And that created a much more robust level of autonomy. And so in some ways, it was kind of cheating because DARPA originally said we wouldn't, you had to do GPS denied navigation. But that was just really too hard. Um, but I think it points to the fact that if you know your location, you can operate more confidently and robustly in the world. And, and so that's why this course is so important. I really think this ability to, to, to move in the world and know your position is a fundamental uh, uh, technology of robotics. And uh, we need more PhD students studying it. We need more good work. There's more, there are, there's more good work to be done. I'll stop there.